So the title of our message this morning, Be Not Afraid, Be Not Afraid, comes to us from a story from Joshua, in particular, chapter 1, verse 9. And I was so elated, I finally found a way to talk about karate in church, right? And I did it uh, for, the, for the kids' sermon, and I get to do it for the adult sermon, because I used to watch these karate kid movies growing up in the 80s, okay? Some of you, you'll, you'll remember this, these are, these are iconic movies back in the 80s, okay? And uh, as of 2010, in fact, I think there are now five of these movies, if you can believe it. So they made five of them. And these films are a lot of fun to watch for grown-ups, just like they are for kids. And all three of my kids, in fact, have enjoyed them. One scene from the movie, however, always stands out in my mind. For those of you who know these movies well, you might remember that the premise is pretty much the same from movie to movie. You're never going to be surprised by the plot in a Karate Kid film, okay? The older, wiser teacher, Mr. Miyagi, decides to help teach karate to a young, troubled teen named Daniel. And as the story unfolds, our protagonist, our good guy, Daniel, is pitted against the neighborhood bully, okay? So that's the neighborhood bully on the left. He even wears a black karate uniform with a snake on it just like the old westerns we used to watch where the bad guys had the black hats, right? So after this series of awkward and violent encounters, our young good guy, our hero, Daniel, enters a martial arts tournament to defend his title against the bad guy. Everybody with the plot so far? Okay, because they recycle it five times, so. <laughs> the bully is always stronger, faster, and more intimidating than Daniel. It wouldn't be much of an underdog story if he wasn't. As the climatic ending fight scene unfolds, there comes a point when a beaten and bruised Daniel wants to quit and give up. By this point, he has endured round after round of bumps, bruises, and at several intervals, the bully even gets away with cheating. So Daniel looks to his coach and his mentor, the older, wiser Mr. Miyagi, and he tells him he wants to give up. Mr. Miyagi then utters these cult classic words. He says, it's okay to lose to an opponent, but you must not lose to fear. The rest is cinematic history. Now, this pithy statement is true, and it's interesting that it stuck with me over all these years. In the end, Daniel ends up besting his opponent. Wow, these are just movies. What about situations like this in real life? The question is an important one. Do we let fear beat us, or do we keep fighting? Now, we all long for a mentor like Mr. Miyagi when the deck is stacked against us, I think. Well, friends, if you keep up with news headlines and current affairs, the latest fear is the possibility of a worldwide pandemic called the coronavirus, or COVID-19. We can barely get away from this. It's on every news station, it's on CNN, it's on the internet, it's word of mouth. It is fear. And for many of us, we are more or less okay as we move through day-to-day -day life, but for some who are given to worry and anxiety, this feeds it. I went to buy hand sanitizer the other day at a local store, the whole shelf was gone. Okay, it's like this mania takes over. I read an article about a mob of panicked people on the East Coast at a Costco who went through and cleaned out the store's shelves, like something out of an H.G. Wells novel. And I personally believe that fear drives too much of our lives. It can often govern how we spend our money, where we allocate our time, how we treat other people, and even whether or not we trust God. So many people elect not necessarily to walk the courageous road or stay the course. Instead, they turn to cynicism as a defense mechanism, really. For example, instead of taking a faith leap and buying a house, someone might simply spend time focusing on all the little things that are wrong with the house. The foundation is cracked, maybe, or they don't like the real estate company. Maybe the siding is old, the windows need replaced, whatever it is. The same type of thing occurs when trying to decide whether or not we trust Jesus. People will often cling to cynical arguments about perceived biblical inconsistencies or point to certain hypocritical people in this church or that one 
as an excuse not to attend or not to believe. But the question remains, do we give in to fear or not? Do we stay cynical and check out? Or do we engage life? Now, the book of Joshua in the Old Testament offers us a lot of insight into the world of courage versus fear. We may remember that God chose Joshua to replace Moses as leader of the Israelites, just as they're about to cross over into the Promised Land. How about that for some pressure? Imagine following the burning bush guy and then trying to impress people, right? Not an easy task. Joshua 1, 9 says this, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Be not afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So Joshua, friends, he's understandably nervous and anxious, okay? For one thing, if God is speaking with you directly, that should give you pause for thought. Second, like I said before, think how it would feel to replace one of the most godly leaders in recorded history up to that time. Sure, Mr. Miyagi tells us it's not okay to lose to fear. Easy for him to say. There's an excellent story in the Old Testament also, if we go back a bit, about a man named Caleb. Caleb was similar to Joshua in character, pose, poise, and demeanor. Caleb was someone who Moses had given charge to go out and explore Canaan. He was to return and give Moses an account of what he saw out there. What he saw was intimidating. Scripture says the land was full of large, strong warriors, well-fortified cities. On the face of it, prospects looked grim regarding a successful takeover of this land by God's people. Things didn't look good in the natural realm. Even though God promised it to Moses and to Caleb, it didn't look good. We've all been there. Maybe a doctor has given us a scary prognosis. Maybe things look financially grim for a while. We start to wonder. Car repair bills, out-of-pocket medical expenses, times when there are more month than paycheck, times where we go to the store and there's no hand sanitizer left on the shelf. But God had promised this land to the Israelites ahead of time. It didn't matter what kind of strong army was there or not. This was the same land that Joshua would claim for his people later. Caleb was one of the few who did not let fear and intimidation sway him from taking what God had promised him. He was ready to go, and I suspect he was probably countercultural and a bit politically incorrect for his time. He chased after God with his entire heart. And when you do that, friends, people aren't going to understand it all the time. They aren't. It's going to look weird to them. They might look at you funny. They might wonder why you care so much about church, why you care so much about God or theology, why you keep reading the Bible all the time, why don't you step, watch some games, some sports. Come on. Was Caleb afraid like Joshua at first? Maybe, probably. But the thing that these two men had in common was the fact that they didn't allow fear to take hold or to win. The account in the Bible tells us that Joshua went on to lead the people across the Jordan River into the land flowing with milk and honey. A fearless faith stirs people's hearts and it invites them to follow. I remember I was at an annual conference last year and I, I was taken around and I met a whole bunch of people People I had, I had, you know, might remember later, maybe not, but one gentleman stuck out in my mind. I had never met him before that day. His name was Mike, and Mike was a natural, charismatic leader, okay? So I met him, and five minutes later, I was ready to throw on a helmet and grab a rifle and do whatever, right? Weird feeling, weird feeling, like something compelled me to do it. So pretty soon after five minutes meeting this gentleman, there was a group of ten people formed around him, and he was... <laughs> He was deciding where we were going to go eat and what us we were going to ride, and it was just natural, just natural. And uh, I was ready to follow him. You could tell he was faithful. He had this deep faith, and God had given him this gift. A fearless faith stirs people's hearts and invites them to follow. And by the way, I don't think that having a fearless faith necessarily equates to ignoring the costs, right? 
We would do well to heed the, Roman, the warning from Romans 10.2 about having a zeal not according to knowledge. We don't jump into an empty swimming pool with blinders on or follow someone based on hearsay or rumor. It's okay to do our homework. If we're going to cultivate a Caleb heart and a Joshua heart, then we need to be listening to God, though. Not just our own opinions and biases. And the way to know God is to study what he said. We read the Bible, we absorb its truths, and we allow the Spirit to take hold in our life. Because if God is a being of infinite goodness, and trust me, he is, then he is prudent and he is wise as well. So we act according to knowledge whenever possible, but we also trust God. So across the span of all of these Karate Kid sequel movies, the good guy always wins. But the avid connoisseur and film watcher will notice also that Daniel, the good guy, was not impervious to intimidation or to struggle either. Some of his victories were hard fought, barely accomplished, he may have been holding the trophy at the end of the movie, but he was often banged up and bruised a little bit. And so it may be with you and I as well. Being fearless requires faith in God, and that faith often comes over time and through a series of difficult events. It's a journey, of course, not just a destination. And if your eyes are only on the trophy, then you will miss everything in between. If we're going to cross the Jordan River, I'm betting we might get a little bit wet in the process. Unless, of course, God parts the water for us. But either way, courage is still required to put one foot in front of the other and keep going. So count the cost. Lay out a plan. Face off with the bullet. No one leaves the arena with a trophy unless they first walk onto the mat. And it helps to take your whole team with you when you go to a tournament and to believe in them and to have them trust their training. And it doesn't hurt to have an experienced teacher in their corner either. That, of course, is God. Be not afraid. Will you pray with me? Father God, we know you did not give us a spirit of fear. We may be concerned, but we are not worried. We are not hopeless. Whatever it is we're going through. We choose to trust in you, God. To trust in your words, your commandments, your edicts. With whatever it is we're struggling with. And then we make the decision for ourselves and our hearts to be not afraid.